it's nice to come somewhere where I don't have to sweat. Um, I'd like to uh, take a brief opportunity, and it can only be brief uh, this afternoon, to, uh, to talk a little bit about um, managing cyclone impacts uh, on the banana industry. I guess there's a, probably a little bit to go through because bananas are pretty much unlike just about every other crop that I know. Uh, so I'll give you a bit of a beginner's guide to bananas. We'll talk about it, why cyclones and bananas don't mix. And we can talk about then the different ways that we can manage the risk. And of course, finishing with the acknowledgements. So, um, bananas. The banana industry is, is probably a little bit of a sleeper. Uh, it's a relatively large industry by value. It's worth between four and five hundred million dollars annually as a farm gate value. It contributes over a billion dollars annually to the Australian economy. That's all off about 14,000 hectares. So it's a very high value intensive industry. It's predominantly based in the subtropics and tropics of Queensland, New South Wales, Western Australia and the Northern Territory. Uh, but it is mostly, and I'll put the big yellow star up here where I live, uh, mostly now in the northeast of Australia. And that's primarily been driven by better climatic conditions, so increased productivity and better quality. So from the 1980s and 90s, where most of the production was here, it's now up here. Of course, the North Queensland industry, <coughs> excuse me, of the 14,000 hectares nationally, we have about 12,500 of which 10,000 is based on the coastal plain south of Cairns. And that's, um, that, as I said before, is primarily driven by, uh, by climatic reasons, but it has this big drawback, and that is that we have this incredible geographic concentration. 90% of Australia's bananas are grown in a region 160 kilometres long and 50 kilometres deep. And so when we get a major episodic event, then it can potentially take out the vast majority of the uh, Australian supply. One of the other things that's important about bananas to know is they're a non-seasonal crop. They, they flower, they harvest in every week of the year. So uh, it's one of the attributes that consumers, I guess, and the market likes about them. We have continuous fruit supply. Uh, this, um, this graph is a bit of a demonstration of the dispatch figures out of North Queensland in 2009. The red bar represents about what the market needs to match supply and demand. And you can see, apart from uh, flooding, cutting the Bruce Highway and stopping transport getting through in February, we pretty well match, um, I have a continuous fruit supply. But this is one of the things that cyclones can affect. So, cyclones and bananas, why don't they mix? Well, the thing about bananas is that they are not a tree, they're a herd. And so, Every bit that you see above the ground is actually rolled up leaf. There's no woody tissue, so there's no inherent strength. They're very susceptible to wind damage. And in 2011, Cyclone Yassi came barreling in. Um, and what it does is this. So effectively, we had um, about 89% of the Australian crop looked like this after a six hour period. And there's two things that that happen. I guess one is because it's only leaf, it's incredibly susceptible to relatively low strength winds. 100 to 120 kilometre an hour winds are enough to blow down a plant with a bunch. Um, and and that, that susceptibility to wind damage is really a function of wind strength and wind resistance. So as a plant gets bigger, a mature banana plant is three to three and a half metres tall, will often have a bunch weighing 40 to 50 kilos on it. That's at its most susceptible stage. Um, so we get a blowdown, and what we've, what's happened here is every mature plant is gone. And it's probably seven to eight months before we'll be at a point where we can harvest again. And so out come the two, out, uh, two main outcomes of a cyclone here. Firstly is you get an immediate loss of crop. And, uh, and that will last for seven to eight months, sometimes nine months, depending on the severity of the damage, uh, before those surviving plants, which I should point out if I go back, that that you can see the vegetative suckers, which is how bananas propagate themselves from crop cycle to crop cycle. It takes seven, eight months for them to grow in the tropics to the point where they can be harvested. So we get um, high prices, we get much consumer comment. Um, I'd never been rung by the Reserve Bank before, but that happened in 2007. Um, <coughs> I thought they just wanted to know about my home loan. Uh, <laughs> But what consumers and, and, and people in urban Australia don't often see is then the second part of the cycle. And that is that 
that we take this, this crop, this uh, geographic region, and we synchronise the entire crop. And we do that by taking out all the mature plants, bringing away immature vegetative plants all at the same time in the same region. And so you get 12 months worth of production arrives in a three or four month window. And we call that the cyclone crop cycle. It's a, a geographic region-wide synchronisation. And that's best illustrated in this slide of the, the dispatch of fruit out of North Queensland after Cyclone Larry in 2006 and 2007. And what you can of course see is that the very low fruit supplies that everyone complained about. Then we get a major spike of production. Now this should have been much higher, except that about 15 to 20 percent of the production area wasn't replanted uh, due to concerns about availability of labour. We then get another cycle of undersupply as the plants in their synchronised crop now go through their crop cycle and phenology, followed by a second glut. And in fact, it takes nearly two years, or more than two years, to get back to a normal supply situation. So you get this major under and over supply cycle where at each point the producer loses because he's got no crop and high prices, he's got all crop and no prices, and so it goes. So economically it's a big impact. So I guess the question is what can we do about this? Well, after Cyclone Larry, we got some very definite market signals about the need to geographically diversify the industry to avoid a repeat. And the industry, through Horticulture Australia, invested funds to look at alternative production regions. The issue is that bananas are a crop of the tropical, humid lowlands. Um, they're very picky about where they will and won't, won't grow, and particularly with respect to production and quality attributes that are demanded by the market. So we need to align a lot of key variables. Um, one of the main ones is temperature. They're a tropical crop, but they don't like it too hot. So the 33 degree isotherm there is about the limit for where commercial banana production with commercial quality can exist. That's in uh, for January. Thank you very much um, to the Met Bureau. They've got wonderful graphics. They're also very sensitive to cold. One of our major quality problems is a thing called field chilling, which you guys might laugh, but that's when the temperature gets below 13. Um, and, <laughs> and so it really starts to limit the geographic regions when you add on top of that the fact that you need adequate water. Bananas are very, uh, very thirsty. They need about a megalitre per hectare per month. Uh, you need a large available labour force. You need logistics and transport. You need good soil. The reality is that we're going to stay in the tropics um, because that's where we're best positioned. And that, add on top of that the fact then we want somewhere where we don't get cyclones. And uh, thanks again to the Bureau for their wonderful graphics, but uh, the reality is that diversification opportunities are about spreading the risk. It's about existing producers taking some of their production as an insurance crop and an insurance farm and putting it in a different region such that the likelihood of being hit in both places at the same time is very, very zero or very close to zero. But the reality of finding cyclone-free zones in the tropics in Australia is, uh, is a bit pie in the sky. So the main production will remain in far north Queensland. It won't go to the Northern Territory because they've had a major disease outbreak of biosecurity issue there, which is uh, stock production. And we have had some diversification already in areas in uh, the southeast of Cape York Peninsula, up around Cooktown. So if production's gonna remain in the tropics and cyclones are going to remain a threat, how do we try and keep this number one Fresh, uh, fresh produce selling line in, in supermarkets on the shelves. And we got to think about this as staying put and getting smarter. So I said before, the damage is about wind resistance by wind strength. One of the ways that we can deal with that is we can actually remove some of the wind resistance. Uh, this is a block a week after Cyclone Yassi in, in Innisfail, and this particular grower had actually gone around in the six hours prior to the cyclone and cut the entire canopy off his plants, which is something that you can do in bananas provided they're at the right growth stage. Peter mentioned about the importance of phenology. And that's one of the issues. Is that this is essentially to make sure the wind doesn't blow plants out of the ground. One of the unforeseen um, positives of it was that these plants cropped earlier rather than the ones that were growing the full crop cycle back. But it comes with some real downsides. What happens when you take the canopy off a plant late in its development? On this side, we've got a typical 50 kilo bunch on this side, what happens when you take the canopy off late in its development? Yields less than half, um, quality severely affected because the fruit's very short. It's also a process that's difficult and slow to implement. And because you end up in this situation where you have a lot of 
very short fruit that is out of market spec, if you don't actually get wiped out, then this is probably one of the worst things you can do. So you need some certainty of impact. And so with Cyclone Yassi, we had that. This thing was 600 kilometres wide, was coming at us, and everyone just went, holy hell, we'll get out there and do some of this stuff. But for low-intensity cyclones or smaller cyclones, this is, is quite a high-risk strategy. But it does provide some early cash flow and some early fruit. So the other big elephant in the room is about how we manage that, that cycle of over and under supply as a consequence of the crop synchronisation. And we're able to work the opportunity after Cyclone Larry to work on that and to implement that in Yassi. In this farm, in the Innisfail area, what you can see is in the background there's a block which is left to recover from the cyclone in its cyclone cycle. Block in the foreground here was similarly in that same cycle, but at a predetermined point, we basically went in and cut all the plants down and forced away their vegetative suckers. What that does is offset that crop cycle by about three or four months. And if we do that in a sequence, as we proposed in, uh, in partnership with the Australian Banana Growers Council, we come up with a staggered return to cropping. And the idea is to return to that continuous fruit supply much earlier than normal. Now, this comes at some cost because growers are foregoing some cash flow, often negative, but some. And so there are issues around the affordability of this. So it's not just a discussion with the producer, it's a discussion with their bank manager. Um, but what happens when you do that, and we were able to track this through some, some small plot trial work, was funded through the Natural Disaster Relief Arrangements. If you look at the pink line, that represents the proportion of the population harvested in each week of the year in 2011 and 12. We get this major peak of production that is the return of the synchronised crop, then very little production in the middle and rising to another oversupply period towards the end. Compare that to the blue line, which is where we've implemented the staggered cropping practice. And that's allowed us then to get much closer to an ordinary supply, which in 12 months' time would smooth out to about 2% of harvest every week of the year. So I guess, guys, in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that uh, because we don't have large areas of agricultural land within five degrees of the equator, cyclones will always be an issue for the banana industry. Um, it is a significant industry. It's, it's uh, a significant part of the fresh, fresh produce um, in any uh, supermarket or, or other outlier. So we need to manage the impacts to supply. And I guess the industry now is a lot better placed than, that, than it was before. Um, we do have some geographic diversification occurring, but there's a lot of reasons why that's not happening quickly, largely to do with cash flows and capital investment and the ability to access a lot of areas that are suitable. We also now have farm practices that uh, can help us manage those impacts, but they only manage or mitigate. Um, we, can't, we can't prevent these things from happening, um, but what we can try and do is to ensure that there's some fruit supply there. Uh, just acknowledgements. None of this can be done without funding. Um, my own organisation, Horticulture Australia, the Australian Banana Growers Council. Uh, banana producers were very willingly sharing a lot of the practical implications of the things that they tried. And, uh, and of course, um, I wasn't the only one standing in the paddock doing some of this trial work. Thank you.